The 80s was the greatest time in history to be a kid for many reasons. One, you could just ride around on your bike all day, go play in a dumpster, come back at 6 p.m. Your parents didn't give a shit. And we lost a couple kids. You know, a couple people didn't come back every once in a while. But that's what you get. That's the risk you take if you have freedom. Uh, it was also great because of the toys. Definitely the greatest era of toys. The action figure market was basically created for us and perfected by Mattel and Hasbro and Kenner. And we got some of the greatest toy lines of all time. How do I know they're the greatest toy lines of all time? Go to the toy store now. Look at what's on the toy shelves. Look at what everybody's buying. And it's all the same shit from the 80s. It's all come back because the 80s is the greatest toy era of all time. We're gonna talk about the greatest toys from that era that my top 20 this is personal, this is my top 20. Now I will say I am very educated in this realm because I had divorced parents and my mom wanted to win my affection. We were poor, but she didn't give a shit. She spent her money on buying, sending my spoiled ass to the store and my boy to buy toys. Now I was very excited by the idea of new toys, new lines. I had gotten hooked by G.I. Joe and Star Wars and Transformers and Mask, and I wanted new stuff all the time. And pretty much anytime something new came out, I would try it out, I'd take a look and um, get by a couple. So I have a couple of just about everything and, uh, and, and can and speak to how fun these things are. So this is my take on the top 20 toys of all time. We get to the later ones, we're gonna use some of the criteria to judge how we get to the, uh, you know, what I think is the best. And this is where we may disagree. Uh, but here's my top 20. My number 20 is Indiana Jones. Now I was obviously an Indiana Jones fanatic as anybody in the 80s probably was. And uh, now that the series has shit to bed and made two really terrible movies, but we still got those three great movies. Now, the Indiana Jones line was a failure. It was an attempt by Kenner to duplicate the hit success of Star Wars, but it just didn't quite work out and nobody bought these things. But I gotta say, they were pretty fun. They had a lot of good little features in them. You could stage the famous truck scene where Indiana Jones you know, uh, fights a bunch of Nazis on the truck holding the uh, holding the lost Ark and you could drag them along on the back uh, of the truck by a rope. You, you could get the Well of Souls set which had a bunch of toy snakes and a knocked down wall uh, and it had just a lot of this stuff from the movie so it was really fun there and pretty much every minor character you, uh, you had in that three and three quarter inch size so they are fun figures they looked pretty good and who doesn't love another harrison ford action figure unfortunately it did fall apart it wasn't a big success and only lasted a couple of years so the scope of it is pretty low and that's why it sits here pretty low now going to the movies one more time my number 19 is robocop now robocop was a cartoon based on the extraordinarily violent and disgusting movie by Paul Verhoeven. And that's why this, even though they're not really great figures, they don't have great articulation and they don't move, it's got to go high up on the list just for taking a Paul Verhoeven movie and turning it into a children's toy line. You know, who shouldn't play with the most violent and disgusting movies of all time, right? I think they should make all Paul Verhoeven movies uh, into 80s cartoons. Let's do Showgirls next. I would buy those figures. Number 18. Number 18 is one of the many times that Hasbro tried to capture lightning in a bottle again and do the same thing they had done with uh, G.I. Joe and Transformers, create a new world. And many times this fails. But all the, every time I was in and I, I uh, did buy a lot of these. And this these are called Visionaries. And what I liked about Visionaries is they had a medieval, um, like a high-tech medieval look to them. They were slightly bigger than G.I. Joe's but had the same articulation. And the articulation is one of the most important things a toy can have. That's why what's at the top of the list is going to sit at the top. And some of the other more famous ones are going to sit lower. Is and they, so they were well articulated. They had some really good vehicles, a big giant giant tank. The mixture of technology and medieval style weaponry is always kind of 
is always something that I, I appreciate. They also had a gimmick that was kind of cool, and that's another thing that will give it some marks for innovation. I love love the love when the gimmick is fun and adds to the play. So the gimmick of these guys was you had a hologram both on their chest and on a banner that they might carry, and those holograms held their powers. So you could you know harness the power of a lion or a bear, and the bear would come out and fight. So Visionaries didn't get too far, but I thought it was a good line. I had hoped it would continue. Next in line, we have Eagle Force. Eagle Force was a series of really tiny little die-cast metal guys that uh, were similar to a G.I. Joe, very, very much like a G.I. Joe Force. They had a tank that had um, a motorized tank. They had a giant Eagle Fortress that I still have somewhere. And they were fun. They had, uh, you know, uh, several different characters. Now, somebody has rebooted Eagle Force and is currently producing, I think, six-inch Eagle Force figures. Solid die-cast metal fighting figures armed with the most sophisticated and military weaponry, ready to fight evil wherever it strikes. And this is the enemy, General Mamba and the roving international organization of Tyranny, better known as Riot. Soon to be introduced with powerhouse commercials like these. Next, we have Brave Star. Now, Brave Star, I got into Brave Star. Brave Star was a Wild West in outer space figure. He had didn't last long again. It was kind of a failure. But what I loved about Brave Star is he came with a pretty innovative feature, which was like a laser tag style backpack that you could put on him and his villain, and you could duel them. And um, you would, you know, score points if you hit, just like laser tag, but in, in a figure form. And so that made him a lot of fun. He also had some bizarre side characters, an alien saloon owner, a little person of some sort. But it was a fun line. Again, another one of those that just fell uh, to the wayside in a highly competitive world where they were putting out a new one of these every, you know, few months. But I liked it. Next in line, we have Silverhawks. Now, Silverhawks was the uh, somewhat of a ripoff of Thundercats, the same company. Had a hit with Thundercats and decided to create Silverhawks. And Silverhawks are just not as good as Thundercats. Uh, they do like a few things about the Silverhawks. They're sort of cops in outer space. They had silver armor and, the, and little birds that they came with. They had a pretty badass villain, Monstar, who had a good look and the cartoon was okay. Um, my favorite was the guy with the guitar, right? I, I had the guy with the guitar and I liked him. Again, the, the, it didn't last too long. Uh, they stopped producing these figures. I also feel like the paint um, chipped. They were all silver hawks and they were not so silver after a little while. Um, but, uh, you know, they're a decent line. Next, we have Centurions. Now, Centurions were suited soldiers that had modular suits that you could add and stick on weapons. Some company is now, like Ramen Toys, something like that, is producing Centurions again. Um, and they had a pretty good look. They had some good villains, a guy with two rope heads, you know, uh, and had some fun and there's a cartoon and all the time any any time one of these things came out you'd have the toy you'd have the cartoon you'd have the comic book and that would get me right into it and i would experiment with them uh, again it didn't last very long so um would i have continued collecting them if it had maybe but alas it did not okay next in line we're gonna have she-ra and obviously He-Man's gonna be a lot higher on this list, but I think She-Ra should not be um, should not be left out. Now, I remember I think She-Ra clearly failed for a bunch of reasons. Princess of Power. Now there's more power than ever from the Princess of Power collection. You can pretend the lovely Flutterina has the power to fly. She-Ra was marketed both to boys and girls because they found actually it turns out that Mattel had found that a lot of the kids that were playing with He-Man were girls and so they wanted to capture that market. What I love about She-Ra is the idea of like let's take Barbie and take all the good stuff about Barbie but let's make Barbie kick some ass because honestly Barbie can't do shit. All right, my, my daughter has a bunch of Barbies and I play Barbies with my daughter or whenever uh, she asked me to. But Barbie's frustrating because Barbie can't do shit. She can't hold anything. Her arms, are, her hands are like this. You can't put anything in your hands. You gotta like put a little, you know, they just, everything falls out of her hands. And she's, her arms don't move very well. She, they say she can do anything. No, she can't. She can do nothing. 
Okay, and so to give girls like a real hero, I think was a great idea and so innovative because there's very little of that in the this is maybe the the first version of like let's make an action toy for girls ever. Uh, unfortunately, they, they apparently didn't know how to market it. They didn't know, does it go in the girl aisle? Does it go in the boy aisle? Honestly, I'm going to say it's a boy in 1980, whatever. You would not be caught dead in that girl aisle. But man, I wanted a she -Ra. She looked pretty. She, it's probably a fetishy thing, I'm going to be honest with you. She, you know, uh, at the time, you know, I wanted a you know, hot, kick-ass, you know, blonde Barbie girl. I think I maybe got one. But I did get Hordak and all the villains, and I was into she -Ra, even though I didn't want to admit it. Now with uh, you know the world as it is and boys and girls and who the, who the hell knows what a boy and a girl is anymore, you know I'm sure Shira would probably do better today if kids play with toys, but they don't. But Shira was a great collection, and you could have a real good world built and noble for its attempt to give girls what they wanted and also bring them into the fold of like fantasizing about you know action and battles and shit. Next we have Rambo and the Force of Freedom. Again, anything that takes what is essentially an R-rated hyper-violent movie and makes it for kids, you know, for kids, is all right with me. You know, for kids. Rambo and the Force of Freedom was something I collected, I just about got all of. It was really, really fun. They were bigger figures. The Sylvester Stallone likeness was pretty great. And even though there was a, a pretty shitty cartoon uh, al alongside that made it goofy and made it feel kid-like, I was, my mother had like no uh, boundaries and she let me watch whatever. So I had seen Rambo. So when it came out with the, you know, Russian guy that tortures Rambo in, in action figure form, I remembered, oh, that's the guy who tortures Rambo, you know, and, and, and uh, electrocutes him and shit. So the fact that they, they did that is just kind of screwed up, and I love it. And so uh, Rambo and the Force of Freedom was pretty awesome. They did have a lot of good weapon features. They had rocket launchers. They were nice for their size, and I'm a big Sylvester Stallone fan and always have been, so it was nice to have a Stallone figure. So uh, I love Rambo and the Force of Freedom, one of the best toys of the 80s. Okay, next we have superpowers. Now, superpowers should be higher on the list because, man, if I did not want some super, I was a comic book dork, as you can probably guess. I was really into superheroes, and I wanted a good-looking superhero action figure. And superpowers came out and finally gave us that, but not. Because that's the problem is they just were not very well designed. You know, you have a Batman who doesn't have open hands, doesn't come with a batarang, had, uh, you know, limited articulation. Sometimes they had special features, which were okay. But the later run of, of Superpowers got better and better, though. They brought in Darkseid and all of Darkseid's minions, Steppenwolf, and the weird little mad scientist-y guy and the big brutish guy. And uh, they also brought in some more obscure uh, superheroes, Cyborg, which was almost impossible to get, and um, Red Tornado. And that became pretty fun, and so Superpowers was a good line. It also came with a couple, like, you know, there, there were a couple of great play sets, the Hall of Justice and also the uh, a Batmobile that had you know a battering ram and a claw that dropped out of the back and it, all kinds of special features in it. So Superpowers was great. After Superpowers, we have one of my favorites, and even though it was a complete flop, as that's Inhumanoids. Now, one of the reasons I love Inhumanoids is it shares a lot of the DNA with G.I. Joe. The head writer of Inhumanoids was Flint Dill, who wrote the majority of the episodes, or a good good chunk of the, the first season or two of G.I. Joe cartoon. It also has a lot of the voices, so the voice of the monster decomposes, of course, Chris Latta, the Cobra Commander, and Starscream. <laughs> And uh, many other voices are shared in the Inhumanoids world with G.I. Joe. What I love about Inhumanoids is the big, giant, disgusting monsters. These things are pretty gross. And this is apparently why it failed, too. One of the theories of why it was such a flop was that moms would come and see you know, their soldiers in their you know, heroic suits and be like, okay, I'll buy that, but I'm not buying that big, disgusting monster. Look at Deacon Bowles. He's gross looking. He looks like a, a horror movie monster. He's got his rib cage showing. His guts are kind of coming out. And uh, so... And the other thing looked like Satan. I mean, I imagine, like, you know, that thing is like a devil, right? And so 
But the idea of these giant, massive monsters fighting these soldiers. Now, I haven't never got any of those monsters. I'm sort of eyeing them on eBay right now. They're running a few hundred bucks, and they're pretty tempting. But the idea of giant monsters is always sort of fun. The other thing I love about Inhumanoids is it has a pretty crazy-ass cartoon. Uh, apparently, they got sick of... Uh, they figured out that it was going to be canceled. They just did whatever the hell they want. And so what you see in the, the cartoon is it's very horror-based. It's actually very almost disturbing and scary for a cartoon of that era and they pushed the boundaries and did things that they wouldn't have done and something that was going to be a raging success so in humanoids is an awesome toy line that i wish had gotten a few more years next in line we have cops hasbro using what they learned from gi joe and transformers to build a whole new universe and i actually think it was really successful uh if it didn't succeed enough to keep going they were great toys these were really great toys one thing i loved about cops was it seemed to be an evolution from robocop it was cybernetic cops in a futuristic world fighting crooks and what's great about these guys is uh, um, you didn't have really a co any cop action figures, any sort of crime related action figures other than maybe like the chips action figures that were pretty crappy. And so it was kind of fun, but they all had really fun special features and, and that's sort of the innovation of these care of this th this line. They came with cap guns. I'm a federal agent. Give up you crooks, you're surrounded by the cops. So that was really fun. And in addition to the cap gun innovation, a lot of them had very unique weapons like the sheriff looking guy had a thing that launched a net that had you know balls on it so it could wrap around you, worked pretty well. We had a, a guy, a character with a battering ram, a, a character with a you know a handcuff launcher that could long arm, would shoot an extended rope uh, um, which would, would connect his handcuff. We had a character with like a you know mutton junkyard ripoff with like a robot dog that had a um, a police siren on the top of it. They came with some vehicles. Their villains were also really fun and looked like scummy, you know, underworld villains. The main villain being a big, massive dude, looked like the kingpin. Um, they had a, a weird, mad scientist guy whose brain was showing through a glass. So there's a lot of inventive designs. They were a lot of fun and a lot of fun in their special features. They also were really well artic articulated. They were a bit bigger. So they're a lot of fun to play with, and I uh, unfortunately it suffered from having Deke produce the cartoon. Deke is the company that took over from Sunbow. God help whoever made the decision of getting rid of the license to Sunbow and giving over their IP to fucking Deke, because Deke blows at everything, and everything Deke does is shit, except for maybe Inspector Gadget. So uh, the cartoon was goofy, and. Uh, Eventually, cops didn't succeed as I had hoped, but I had fun with it and would have kept going if they had kept making them. After cops, we have another one that this is one that I would say is not a, a massive hit, but one I just kind of have a personal love for, which is Sectors. I was a big Sectors fan, and Sectors were insect people in a fantasy world. Uh, they came with medieval style weapons and they all came with you know, you know different insects that did different things that would squirt water or do something. But the greatest innovation of the line, why I think it's, it's noteworthy, is that uh, the main characters rode giant monster puppets that were like hand puppets. So you had one that was like a fly kind of thing. It was a hand puppet or a spider, and they were you, you'd stick your hand in it, and the character would ride on it. They're big, and they move kind of well, and they had lots of weapons. There was a cartoon, uh, and a, there was a comic book, but uh, and it just had a cool feel, and is really memorable as one of those very cool lines that unfortunately died before its time. The next seven now are the the iconic seven. These are the ones that probably all of us would have on our list and the greatest toy lines of the 80s in some order. I'm gonna tell you my order. I'm gonna give you a little justification for my order. I think that when you look at a toy line, what makes it great? We're gonna look at five factors, okay? Factor number one would be design. And this design is gonna include the sculpts, the articulation, anything that that is in the design of the characters. The second is the innovation. This is like special features, gimmicks, um, how innovative was the, 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 or the toy makers in creating this line, trying something new. The third thing that is very important is the lore, because I think lore actually is one of the things I'm most obsessed with, and what keeps me here is that 
the lore uh, adds to your ability to play by giving you more fuel. Um, and the lore could come from comic books, cartoons, file cards, movies, anything. The bigger and better the lore, the more exciting the toy line was for me. Fourth, we have scope. How big did it get? Right? And that is a, something that is really going to damn something like, you know, I think something like Cops was super fun. Uh, and maybe could compete with some of these others and its ability to be innovative, its design, everything. But because of its scope was so limited, it just didn't get far enough for you to be able to really have a world built. But these other ones, you could really build yourself a giant world if you were a super fan. So, and the last thing is sort of a more nebulous quality of playability. How fun did I think they were? Well, you know. So, I'm going to give you my ratings for these last seven uh, big guys um, for, for those numbers here. At number seven, we have Thundercats. Now, Thundercats, obviously, one of the biggest toy lines of the era. And these were great figures. And I really did like some of the characters. I think Mumra is a pretty great villain. He's got a great look. I think the art in the cartoon is pretty good. I think the cartoon's an okay cartoon only. But the art is pretty great. And uh, by the end of it, you could build yourself a little world. Um, there was some great play sets and vehicles and a bunch of good villains. For me, their articulation was only okay. The sculpt and the look of them, I'm going to give them pretty high high marks. If the articulation, they're pretty mediocre. As far as the gimmicks, uh, they had you know they weren't, they weren't inc there's nothing incredibly innovative here. Uh, so I'm gonna give them a three. Uh, the lore, they had a comic book and a cartoon. I didn't really, I barely remember the comic book and the cartoon was a mid-range cartoon is in my opinion. And as far as scope, they did get pretty, it did get pretty big and they did get to build a pretty great world. That which is one of the reasons why they're considered one of the greats of the era. Next in line, we're gonna go Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is a little bit of a, a little bit of a later in the 80s they became really big uh, I was a fan of the comic book and and the cartoon and everything and I, I so I'm a, I would say I'm a casual Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles fan and always have uh, uh, been it's one of those things that stayed around forever and the action figures were decent what is what makes them great is how long it stayed around and how big the world got and how many figures you could have by the end of the run and the many different runs of it. For design, I'm going to give them about a three. The sculpts are good, but the articulation is minimal. Innovation, there's not much there, not too much in innovative about them. So again, a three. The lore, well, you got the comic books, you've got both. Similar to G.I. Joe, you've got a, a dark version, the comic book that is more realistic and and, and the goofy ass cartoon, which is just super fun. So you get into it as like a four year old and stay with it as a teen if you wanted to because of the lore. So uh, and the scope is pretty big. Just watch. It's the turtle's gigantic and wacky attack aircraft, the turtle blimp, featuring pistol grip and wacky bombs with trigger release. Cowabunga! Next in line, we have He-Man. Now, I was a pretty big He-Man fan at the time. I used to uh, wake up every morning, and I hate mornings. My mom would give me some coffee. I'd drink my coffee and get all angry that I had to go to school, and I'd just watch He-Man. I'd be like, mm, I hate school. I don't want to go and watch He-Man. And so I collected He-Man. Now, I love, uh, love the idea, the promise of He-Man, which is to take a Frank Frazetta painting or Conan and turn him into a children's toy. And uh, the scope of the world got massive with many different characters and lots of different lore and incredible villains and heroes and they were also pretty fun being a little bit larger to play with being that sort of roided out you know muscle muscle man look the scope it gets a pretty high mark i'm gonna say uh its playability is pretty high the design the look the innovation now the innovation is is fantastic for these a lot of time to think with innovation the gimmicks that they make toys have the gimmicks are not that fun they're not really something that are that fun to play with they'll usually give you like a weapon that shoots that doesn't ever hit anything right so in this case though all of the innovation and in he-man were things that were really fun you know having somebody be able to switch their face or having a fuzzy character or having characters that's smelly you know okay so they were really innovative and really imaginative in the various 
characters that they created and constantly doing new stuff. And so I think He-Man is pretty great. We're going to say He-Man maybe falls down a little bit. The cartoon is really goofy, and I know G.I. Joe cartoon is goofy too, but for me... What's nice is you had the cartoon and then you had the very serious, the, the much more serious comic book that gave you a style of, of, if you wanted that more adult version of what you were playing with. And I think there was the potential to do that with He-Man, but it never quite got that. So He-Man. Number four, and this I'm going to get pelted for, but number four is Star Wars. Okay, and the reason why Star Wars, now being that it is the one that started the action figure craze, and also being, you know, the biggest IP in the world, you think maybe it should be at the top of this list, and for some of you, it might be. And I would say, um, for lore, obviously, it is the top because you have the movies backing it. I think you remove the lore, the movies that are backing this thing, the toy is a really, really mediocre toy. I mean, let's look at this Luke Skywalker. Does that look like Luke Skywalker? That looks more like Dakota Fanning than it looks like Mark Hamill. The five-point articulation makes them sort of weak. They're not incredibly innovative. The lightsabers that stick out of your arm weren't really fun. They came with minimal accessories, and a lot of their sculpts aren't very strong. So I think... Um, they're they're where they get really high marks for the having the the backing of the greatest IP the world has ever known and the scope because by the end of this thing man you could have a massive world like I had my my best friend growing up as a was was a Star Wars fiend and he I had I was more into GI Joe he's more into Star Wars we both loved them both and he had you know he had every section of his basement was he had Hoth and he had Endor and he had everything that you can imagine all lined up so you really could have a great uh, world so where it falls apart for me is just a simple design I just don't think Kenner's very good at designing toys in general exception of one thing and that brings us to number three my third favorite toy is Mask. This is the thing Kenner got right. And maybe it got right because these were like seven points of articulation, right? Because their knees had to bend so they could fit in the vehicles. And they were little figures. You didn't really care about the Mask figures. You cared about the vehicles they came with. And they were the, the fact that they were small was a good thing because it meant the vehicles were more cost-effective. You get more of them. Mask, where illusion is the ultimate weapon. Convert switchblade to jet mode. Surprise, Matt Tracker! It's mayhem! But what I loved about this was how innovative the vehicles were transformed they can these vehicles were had all kinds of hidden weapons it reminded me of the the video game spy hunter that you you know in in arcades back in the day you just imagine having uh, vehicles along the road and then all of a sudden weapons pop out and everybody starts blasting each other so it was a real blast to have these things by the end of the run it had a, a lot of vehicles some of my favorites was there was a, a little jeep that uh, opened up and shot out a boat that was full of weapons you had the rhino which is the big mech truck that had a battering ram and a rocket that shoots across the room and a you know a detachable vehicle you had their volcanic um gas station play set that had a boulder that shot off so Really fun. Then, of course, we had the gimmick of the masks, which would give them a power of some sort. The cartoon was a pretty was a pretty okay. Somewhere along the line, a He-Man, a little too goofy. I think again, Mask would have benefited from having a good comic book uh, for lore. That might be the thing missing from Mask. But as far as like playability, innovation, the toy line itself, I love Mask. One of the best toy lines of all time. That means number one and number two are probably so you're gonna guess. Number two is Transformers, and Transformers is. Um, Obviously, one of the greatest toy lines of all time, um, possibly the one that has survived the most in the public consciousness, as we've had many, many Transformers movies, most of them not very good. But um, they, when I remember the, getting the first few Transformers, loving to transform them, they usually were easy and keep uh, to transform. So they get a really high mark for their innovation and uh, they get the high, absolute highest marks for innovation and gimmicks. They're an absolute top step. Where it, they they fall down a little bit as articulation, which could be hit or miss depending on the figure. You know, some figures, it was like, try to make Optimus Prime kick, you can't. 
Um, somebody like Soundwave was one of my favorites because he could move really well. He could move almost like a G.I. Joe character and Ravage could and fly out of his chest and you know attack somebody. But uh, um, some of them were limited in their articulation as they had to sacrifice the design of the robot version to fit into character mode. Now the newest ones that are coming out now are amazing in that they are gorgeous. They look like their counterparts in the movies to perfection and they transform, but you can't transform them. I bought a bunch of them for my kids and, my, and it took me two YouTube videos in 20 minutes to transform one of them transformed it into a car gave it to my kid and he's like oh he wants to be a robot again and i gave up on life so that they are there so they're at the sacrifice of you know their their former uh lack of articulation for the you know ease of being able to transform them was probably a good thing but obviously it also came with a pretty great cartoon and a and a and comic book and and has had many new incarnations over the years sort of never gone away really so transformers were the second greatest toy line of the 80s with some so many memorable heroes and villains not probably a surprise to you that with the name of this channel being destro is my spirit animal that my number one is gi joe a real american hero now of course that is my number one. I actually think I'm right too. You can have your opinion, but this is why it's right. Okay, one, let's go down the list. Design, from the packaging to the figures themselves, there is no better design toy. The sculpts are incredible. The design of the figures is incredible. The swivel arm battle grip and tilting head and O-ring design made them move like humans as much as any action figure could. The innovation of the way the characters move, the gimmicks, Zartan being able to change his color, the many different vehicles and play sets and incredible innovation of all the vehicles. The special features that would appear in the vehicles makes this a five in innovation. Three, lore. No other series other than maybe Star Wars has as great a lore as G.I. Joe. You had both a cartoon that is honestly hilarious and holds up to this day, even though it's goofy as shit. It's funny and fun and weird in a way that makes it much more watchable than I think He-Man or any of the others. It, and then at the same time, you had these file cards written by Larry Hama, that a man that took it way too seriously and told you their military rank and secondary specialty and gave them like jobs like accountant or chef in the side, right? So, uh, and, and had these great descriptions of the character that made it really rich in your play life. And then you had the comic book, which was another thing that weirdly Larry took too seriously. A guy who had been in the military and brought his knowledge of the military, his knowledge of also uh, martial arts and sword fighting uh, into and created a world that I think he was writing for him, writing to please him. And so the lore of G.I. Joe with those three competing things working together make gives it a absolutely five maybe a six if you could do it, but it's a five scale and finally the scope by the end of this thing you could have world war three you had the biggest vehicle of all time the aircraft carrier a massive space station and your launching system with the defiant terror drones everything hundreds and hundreds of characters they were small and cheap and so therefore you really could build an army and uh for the scope it is uh, number one uh, beating all others out and therefore that's my why i think gi joe is indisputably the number one toy of all time you tell me what you think what did i get wrong what should be higher what would your list look like any toys I missed here that you think deserve to be above something uh, on this list? Uh, let me know what you think in the comments below and like and subscribe. Thanks.